Hello and welcome back to part three of microbial genetics. In this lecture, we're going to learn all about genetic change. There's two mechanisms of genetic change in bacteria. A mutation is a change in nucleotide sequence of the DNA. And if you change the recipe, you're going to get a different product. So it makes a different protein. Mutation can occur spontaneously or naturally, or it can be caused by what's called a mutagen. An example, ultraviolet light will cause changes in DNA. Bacteria, unlike us, are capable of what's called horizontal gene transfer. Yes, that means they can trade genes amongst members of the same generation. Once they have those genes, so here's a new mutation, then they can do what's called vertical gene transfer and pass that on to their prodigy. Vertical gene transfer, the only way we could do a vertical gene transfer would be if we had a mutation in, if you're a woman, in your egg, or if you're male, in your sperm, that would be transferred on to the offspring. But bacteria are different. They're capable of horizontal gene transfer, and we'll look at those mechanisms. And then once, if something is permanent and has been integrated either into their chromosome or their plasmids, then they're capable of transferring it, vertical gene transfer, to the next generation. So let's take a look. And just a little reminder, since we're talking about bacteria, if there's a change in the DNA, that means they're going to have a different genotype. If they have a different genotype, it may show up in their phenotype. So that's the things that you can see. Because bacteria are haploid, there only has to be a change. One change, it's going to show in the phenotype. So within a population, so think Staphylococcus aureus, or think Bacillus cereus. When you have a population of organisms, there's what's called the wild type. The wild type is going to be the original nucleotide sequence that's most common in that species of bacteria. Within that populace, though, there are going to be mutants, so they have slight differences. If there's a mutation in the DNA, then you may see a phenotypic chain. So flagella, no flagella. When you have a slight change in DNA, but they're still the same species, that's where we get the different strains. So here's an example down here. So wild type for E. coli would be tryptophan positive. This means that they had the gene to make tryptophan, which is an amino acid. The wild type E. coli do not require to be grown on media that has tryptophan, so no growth factor required. Since they don't require it, and they are the wild type. They are called prototrophs, so first eaters. There are mutants within that species, so Escherichia coli, that are the strain trip negative. So TRP, usually strains, they'll have three letters. Not always, but in this case, it's three letters and then minus. This means they are lacking a functional gene to make the enzyme necessary to make tryptophan. In that case, they're going to require tryptophan in their growth media in order for them to grow. And so they're called an oxotroph. This prefix oxo means to increase growth. So to increase growth, eaters, you have to give them a growth factor. So these are mutations within a particular species. That's when you get a different strain. So spontaneous mutations, these are genetic changes that result from a normal process. DNA polymerase has proofreading ability, but it makes mistakes. We've all written an essay. We've all had to write something. Sometimes you miss those typos. Spontaneous mutations, they occur randomly at infrequent but characteristic rates. So they call that the mutation rate. So it is the probability of mutation of a given gene per cell division. And usually it's about 10,000 to a trillion. Most mutations are not good. At best, they're going to be silent, and usually they're harmful, but occasionally they're good. Occasionally, but not often, also, mutations can revert back to the original 
DNA sequence and phenotype, and that's called reversion. So just showing you, I love blue lobsters. They're so pretty. About one in two million lobsters is blue, and that is due to a genetic mutation in their coloration. Lobsters make three different layers of colors in their shells, yellow, blue, red. The yellow and the red are suppressed, and you just see the blue. We're just saying mutations are rare. So one in two million. By the way, they taste the same, in case you want to know. So what we care about this mutation rate, this is an amazing YouTube. What you're looking at is an enormous Petri dish and it's gonna show you the mutations that exist within a populace and how the environment will select for those fittest, best capable of leaving offspring. So don't think fittest, it's not a strength thing. Who can leave more offspring? Let's watch it. So what we ended up building was basically a Petri dish except that it's two feet by four feet. And the way we set it up is that there are nine bands, and at the base of each of these bands, we put a normal Petri dish thick agar with different amounts of antibiotic. On the outside, there's no antibiotic. Just in from that, there's barely more than the E. coli can survive. Inside of that, there's 10 times as much, 100 times, and then finally, the middle band has 1,000 times as much antibiotic. And then across the top of it, pour some thin agar that bacteria can move around in. The background is black because there's ink in it, and the bacteria appear as white. First, you see they spread in the area where there's no antibiotic, up until the point they can no longer survive. Then a mutant appears on the right. It's resistant to the antibiotic, it spreads, until it starts to compete with other mutants around it. When these mutants hit the next boundary, they too have to pause and develop new mutations to make it into 10 times as much antibiotic. And then you see the different mutants repeat this at 100. And after about 11 days, they finally make it into 1,000 times as much antibiotic as the wild type can survive. And so we can see by this process of accumulating successive mutations that bacteria, which are normally sensitive to an antibiotic, can evolve resistance to extremely high concentrations in a short period of time. The reason we can watch that occurring is because of their short generation time. Escherichia e. coli doubles or divides every 20 minutes. Also, when you're looking at that Petri dish, you're looking at trillions and trillions of bacteria. So let's look at the take homes and make sure we got that. So large populations such as cells in a colony contain mutants. They're not all identical. The environment, so there being antibiotic in the media didn't cause those mutations. Those just occurred, but only those mutants that could grow can grow in that environment of those increasing concentrations of antibiotics. So what the antibiotic is doing is selecting cells that can grow under or in the pr presence of those antibiotics. An organism that is mutated to become resistant is going to become dominant in that environment where that medication is present. The sensitive cells are killed and the resistant cells survive. So this is that connection. At the very end of the semester, we're going to talk about antibiotics and antimicrobials, and how that overuse of antibiotics, so doctors prescribing antibiotics when really someone has a viral infection just to keep the patient happy. Also people not taking their full round of antibiotics and therefore selecting for those that are resistant to it and allowing them to live. All of this is driving the selection of those antibiotic resistant strains. So that's how come now we have MRSA, where we didn't have that before. Two, through the use of antimicrobial, so disinfectants, some of the organisms also have been selected for that are resistant to those disinfectants. So mutations bring about variation within the same population, so we have the same species, some of those mutants are better fit, can survive in that environment, and leave more offspring. And then they become the dominant in that environment. And so we end up with different strains. Methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus is a strain of 
Staphylococcus aureus. Still the same genus and species. So let's look at types of point mutations. And exactly what it sounds like. At one point, we have a base pair substitution. This is the most common type of mutation that's going to occur during DNA synthesis. Just like if you're typing and you just get one letter wrong. Let's look at the different types. Mutations are either going to be silent mutations, missense mutations, or nonsense mutations. This is going to be the wild type. So this is what it's supposed to be. So we have our DNA. This is going to be our template strand. So from A, we get U, because there's no thymine in RNA. From C, we get G. From A, we get U. So this is the codon. It codes for the amino acid cysteine. If we change this base right here in the third position, so we change it from an A to a G, then we get A, U still, we get C, G still, but now we're going to get a C here instead of a U. Because that genetic code is degenerative, redundant, this is, used to be called the wobble base, it codes for the same amino acid. There'd be no change in phenotype, so that's shh, that's why it's silent. If we change this same nucleotide, instead of changing it to a G, now we're going to go from an A to a C. That's going to change the codon on the RNA to AGG. This is going to co code for a missense mutation, so we're going to have substitution of amino acid. Whether this is going to be a big deal or not will depend upon the chemical nature of that amino acid. If it's very similar in structure, you might get away with it. If it's completely different, so let's say you had something hydrophobic and now you put an acidic amino acid there, that's probably going to cause some problems. Usually what it's going to do is going to change the shape. And when things aren't shaped right, normally you're going to get a protein that does not function normally. One base pair substitution, that's what occurs in sickle cell anemia. So that's just one base pair change, and then you get a hemoglobin molecule that does not function normally. The last type of point mutation is nonsense. If I'm speaking nonsense, you're just going to shut me down. You're not going to listen to me. So if we change this one more time from an A to a T now, now I get UGA. And UGA is one of our stop codons. So now we're going to stop short that transcript. So we're going to end up with a very short often a non-functional protein. So silent, shh, no difference in phenotype, so you still have wild type. Missense, you're going to get a different amino acid, probably not going to function normally, so you're going to see a difference in the phenotype. Nonsense mutation, you're going to stop that. We're going to stop codon, short protein, definitely going to see a change in phenotype. That video in part two that talked about forum sensing, when they were working with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and they took out their quorum signal protein. They did it through what's called knockout mutation. So knockout mutation, you have a gene of interest. For them, it was the quorum sensing protein. They just put a either stop codon, and they just truncated that. They knocked out that gene. So then that's called a knockout mutation. So it's incredibly useful to determine the roles of genes and metabolism um, and pathogenesis. See, there you go. Oh, I inserted something. Uh, I have a frame shift. That's coming up next. So insertions or deletions. I just inserted something. However, two it is. <clears throat> Sorry about that. It's me too. So the impact of insertions or deletions is going to depend upon where in the gene it's being inserted or deleted and its effect on protein folding. Also, the number of base pairs is going to make a difference. Think about it, if you take out a whole bunch of bases, that's probably going to make a big change. Or if you insert a whole bunch, that's going to make a big change. Also, since we are reading things in three base pairs, we read things in codons, we can get what's called a frame shift. So if there is just a three base pair change, so we're either going to put three bases in or take three bases out, we're going to get one or more less amino acids. That's probably going to be less harmful than if we have a frame shift. Because if we shift reading frames, we're going to get a completely different protein. So let's say we just insert one. So that's what they've done down here. So now we have an extra A. So we've shifted this whole reading frame over from here on. So notice we get completely different amino acids. And it may end up in premature termination. So we get a different set of codons completely from the original wild type protein. We often get a premature 
stop codon. So you're gonna end up with a shortened, a very non-functional protein. So these are bad, very bad types of mutations and it's going to knock that gene out. Once again, just keep in mind, whenever we change the shape of a protein, whether it's a structural protein or an enzyme, it's not gonna function right. So shape suits function. Occasionally, very rarely, the changes made make it a better fit enzyme. So let's go now to the story of Barbara McClintock and her transposable elements. Some of the most important principles in modern genetics were either discovered, proven, or first conceived of by a woman who you have never heard of, who spent 40 years of her life studying corn. More than 20 years before Watson and Crick identified the structure of DNA, Barbara McClintock was inventing the field of cytogenetics, the study of the structure and function of chromosomes. In 1931, through her pioneering microscopic techniques, she was the first to prove that genes were physically located on chromosomes. She did that by being the first to also show that chromosomes swap bits of genetic information by crossing over when sex cells are formed. This crossover is one of the most important aspects of reproduction because it explains why sex cells from the same individuals can produce offspring that are different from each other. In the 1940s, McClintock focused on the puzzling color patterns of Indian corn. She wondered why some kernels were white and some were brown and some were purple and some were white with speckles. It was thought at the time that the speckled kernels were mutated white ones, but no one could figure out what caused the mutation. So after breeding inhuman numbers of maize plants over many generations, she realized that the only way that this could happen is if sections of the plant's genome moved from one location to another, sometimes landing smack dab in the middle of a gene for color making the kernel look like it lost a paintball tournament. In this way, McClintock discovered what we now call transposable elements or jumping genes. Turns out that there are stretches of DNA in pretty much every type of organism that can move one location to another, and it's one of the most important sources of genetic mutations, including in humans. Being a lady scientist in the 1940s, though, meant that you couldn't do face-blisteringly awesome science and receive proper recognition. Maybe she should have been baking cakes. Her discovery when it wasn't ignored was ridiculed. But she kept researching and she did a little more genetic pioneering like in 1951 when she discovered that genes were silenced when stuff in a cell's nucleus, later discovered to be enzymes, covered them up. McClintock eventually got so tired of the ridicule that her ideas received that she stopped publishing her research. It wasn't until the 1970s when scientists could actually observe the processes McClintock described that they felt bad for being such patronizing ass faces. So in 1983, 35 years after she published her first paper on transposition, Barbara McClintock was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine for her discovery of mobile genetic elements. And she remains the only woman to receive an unshared Nobel Prize in that category. Thank you for watching. Yes, way to go, Barbara. Yeah, she was 81 when she finally got her Nobel Prize. A great, great, great scientist. One of the big reasons, other than her being female in a male-dominated science, is that they really believed that DNA was stable. Since it was genetic material in the nucleus, nope, nothing's going to change it. So that is the story of Barbara McClintock. Transposons, jumping genes. They're pieces of DNA that can jump and how they jump is that they have these inverted repeats. We're going to watch a YouTube and it's going to show you just how one transposon can move. And if you think about it, if it moves in the middle of a gene, that's how you get your different colors or lack of color. Let's watch. The most direct mechanism for movement of transposable elements is called conservative or simple transposition. In this process, the transposable element is removed from its original site and transferred to a new target site. The transposable element is removed when the enzyme transposase recognizes characteristic inverted repeats at the ends of the element and cleaves the DNA at both ends, releasing the transposable element from its original site. The transposable element stays attached to the transposase enzyme, which cleaves another DNA segment at a particular target sequence. The cleavage at the target sequence produces staggered ends. The transposable element is inserted between the staggered ends. 
Then DNA gap repair synthesis fills in the base pairs in the staggered ends. Thus, the transposable element winds up in its new site between two direct repeats of the target sequence. So transposons, transposal elements, jumping genes. This is going to be part of our mobile gene pool. Yes, they occur in bacteria, but actually about 3% of human DNA is also going to be made up of transposable elements. You can see how if a transposon jumps into the middle of a gene, how it could take that gene out and inactivate it. Most transposons, too, will have a terminator, a transcription terminator, that's also going to prematurely stop gene transcription. So yeah, blocks expression of downstream genes. So we can knock things out. Horizontal gene transfer, this is how bacteria can recombine and move DNA amongst members in the same generation. So this isn't transfer like parent cell to daughter cell. What we end up with is recombinant. So we're recombining two things. And that's when segments of DNA from different sources are joined. So we get new combinations. So there's two ways this can occur. It can occur naturally, or this is what I used to do in the laboratory. So let's say we have a gene of interest that codes for something we want to make. We can insert it into a bacterial plasmid. So remember, those are the bonus genes. And we recombine them. Then we can introduce those through transformation. And then from there, we can use those bacteria to produce that gene product. And so this is often used pharmaceutical proteins, vaccines, vitamins. Uh, I made interleukins for research. And then two, um, DNA production. So also to make those uh, DNA probes or for DNA sequencing as well. So let's look first at plasmids, so just some information. They're very common in the microbial world. Also, uh, protozoan have them and fungi have them. They are double-stranded. They have their own origin of replication. They usually, of course, they're gonna have non-essential genes. If something's essential, it is going to be on the chromosome. These genes will often give an advantage to that bacterium. A plasmid can have few to many genes. So this one's showing you chloramphenicol resistance gene. It's showing you a gene to make a pilus for conjugation. We'll talk about that in just a minute. These plasmids are mobile and they can spread whatever they're carrying, like resistance, very easily between bacteria. This video is going to go through the different types of transfer. They're going to talk about transposition, in case you're wondering, how do you get these plasmids and where do these genes come from? This is when you have a gene in a chromosome. It can move by transposition into a plasmid, so think P and P. Then in this video, we're going to look at transformation, transduction, and conjugation. So those are the three modes of horizontal gene transfer. Welcome back. In this video, we'll be discussing the bacterial genetics, and we'll talk about transformation, transposition, transduction, and conjugation. We'll learn their meanings and how to differentiate between them. So first, let's talk about transposition. The bacteria has its DNA in two parts, either the bacterial chromosome or the bacterial plasmid. The bacterial chromosome is much larger and more complex and contains most of the bacterial DNA. And the bacterial plasmid is a small part of the bacterial DNA that has left the chromosome and now is floating inside the bacteria. So transposition refers to the process of extracting a small part of the bacterial chromosome to become plasmid or reintegrating the plasmid into the bacterial chromosome. Keep in mind that if the bacteria want to share its DNA with another bacteria, it can only share its plasmid, not the chromosomes. So the plasmid is smaller and readily accessible. Just remember that transposition has to do with plasmid. Now let's talk about conjugation. So some bacteria have a sex pilus and we call these bacteria F positive and other bacteria don't have these sex pilus and we call this F negative. Keep in mind that the sex pilus is encoded by the bacterial plasmid, not the bacterial chromosome. So the F positive bacteria will link with the F negative bacteria and form the mating bridge. 
Then the F positive bacteria will make a copy of its plasmid which encodes for the bacterial sex palace and will transfer this copy to the other bacteria. So now both bacteria have a plasmid which encodes for a sex palace and both are called F positive. This is the process of conjugation. Transformation, which is also known as competence, is the ability of the bacteria to take naked genomes or naked DNA from the environment and use this DNA. So for example, if we have some medium with some bacteria in it and we put some raw naked DNA which encodes for antibiotic resistance into this medium as well, this bacteria will be able to take this DNA from the environment and use it and it will become antibiotic resistance. However, if we add a DNA lysing agent into the environment, it will degrade the DNA and the bacteria will not be able to use it. We see this exclusively in Streptococcus pneumonia, H influenza, and Neisseria. So remember, transformation for fresh DNA. And finally, transduction refers to the process where a bacteriophage, which is a bacterial virus carrying its own DNA, will inject this DNA into the bacteria. This viral DNA will be integrated into the bacterial DNA and will start replicating the virus. If this results in a bacterial death, we call this a lytic phage, and if it didn't, we call this a lysogenic phage. If the bacteriophage did not kill the bacteria, aka a lysogenic phage, it will give the bacteria some superpowers, so the bacteria now can produce exotoxins. There are three methods of horizontal gene transfer that bacteria use. Transformation, transduction, and conjugation. These are bacteria in the same generation, so horizontal transfer, and then don't forget vertical gene transfer, that is when it is transferred from a parent cell to the daughter cell. So let's look at transformation. So transformation, that uptake of foreign or fresh DNA. This can be DNA from the same species, different species, doesn't matter. So this naked DNA from the environment, that is the movement of the DNA. When cells die, their life, there's their DNA in the environment. A cell to take it up has to be what's called competent. So they are kind of different. The video kind of made it sound like it's the same. In the lab, if I wanted to introduce a plasmid into a cell, I had to make it competent either by heat shocking it or washing it with calcium chloride can also make it competent. But that allows the cell to just take up the DNA regardless of the origin, doesn't matter. Uh, some species are always competent. You don't have to do anything to them. And like I said, in the lab, I made them so under certain conditions. But the uptake of fresh or foreign DNA in the environment. So once the DNA is in, there's kind of a couple things. The plasmid, remember plasmids are those mobile gene pools, that DNA fragment can go into the plasmid and then it'll be passed on to the next generation or it can be integrated into the chromosome. If it doesn't integrate, then it's not passed on. And sometimes they do, they pick up DNA, doesn't get integrated, they don't want it, they don't use it, and it is not passed on to the next generation. Transformation was discovered by Frederick Griffin in 1928. He knew that encapsulated Streptococcus pneumoniae was virulent and caused the mice to die. He also had a strain that didn't make capsules, and then the mouse lived. He could heat kill the encapsulated cells and knew that that wouldn't kill the mice, and then he took those heat killed cells, which they'd lice and release their DNA, plus those cells that didn't make a capsule, mixed those two together, and these streptococcus pneumoniae would just pick up the gene from the encapsulated strain, and then you would get death of the mouse. He discovered transformation. Things that can be picked up from plasmids and through this transformation process. Yes, antibiotic resistance. Also, antibiotic synthesis. So antibiotics, they come from fungi, but there's also bacteria that make them as well, streptomyces virulence from plasmids. Yersinia pestis causes the plague. Shigella shigellosis, a type of gastrointestinal tract disease. Uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, if you are into organic gardening, you can put bacteria, it will kill pests that way. Rhizobium, the ability to fix nitrogen and be in that symbiotic relationship with plants. Yep, that's all from a plasmid. Pseudomonas that can break down oil comes from a plasmid. 
Hylus, synthesis, E. coli, pseudomonas, all from a plasmid. Toxin, bacillus anthracis, lethal factor, edema factor, all from a plasmid, so just picked up from the environment. And then tumor formation in plants, agrobacterium. You get all kinds of things from transformation, it's just picking up plasmids. The next one is transduction, and this is through that viral infection. So bacteria have viruses that attack them, so they're called bacteriophages. So phage means to eat, so bacteria eaters. Often when speaking about them, if you just say phage, it means a virus that attacks the bacterium. If we just say virus, we're talking about a eukaryotic cell. In generalized transduction, a segment of DNA is carried from one bacterial cell to another by a bacterial virus called a bacteriophage or phage. The phage attaches to the bacterial cell and injects its nucleic acid into the host cell. A phage enzyme is produced that breaks down the host DNA into smaller fragments. Phage DNA is replicated and phage coat proteins are produced. During formation of the mature phage particles, a few phage heads may surround fragments of bacterial DNA instead of phage DNA. The phage particle carrying the bacterial DNA infects another cell, transferring the bacterial DNA to the new cell. When the bacterial DNA is introduced into the new host cell, it can become integrated into the bacterial chromosome, thereby transferring genes to the recipient. This cell then multiplies and carries new genetic material. DNA mediated transduction. So when you see the word transduction, I want you to know that it's horizontal gene transfer through a bacteriophage, so through a viral infection. We're going to study bacteriophages. They have to attach to a host. They insert their DNA, and usually they take over the cell to make more phage particles. They're kind of sloppy in their process. So they take over a cell. They want the cell to make their DNA and their protein capsid, and then they package them together. That's called assembly. But it's a virus. It's not that smart, and sometimes it's sloppy. So sometimes it packages up host cell DNA, so from that bacteria. Then when this virus particle goes on to affect another cell, instead of viral DNA, it's injecting bacterial DNA from another source. And you think, well, that's kind of weird. Yes. But then that bacterial DNA, since just something about bacteria, like, oh, okay. It will be integrated into the bacterial chromosome. So there we have horizontal transfer by transduction, and it'll be passed on to that next generation, and that is vertical transmission. So it's due to a packaging error of bacterial DNA inside a phage head, so inside a bacterial viral head. Yeah, so it's just made by error. Let's let you look at that. The recipient cell that acquires this DNA is going to integrate it into the chromosome. We'll look at this more in depth when we study viruses. But look at what you get. Toxins, toxins, toxins. Clostridium botulinum, remember that makes that neurotoxin that causes flaccid paralysis. Yes, it is from a prophage. This is from a bacteriophage infection that that gene then became inserted into the chromosome. So it is carried with that Clostridium botulinum. Carinibacterium diphtheriae causes diphtheria. That toxin came through a phage infection. Escherichia coli. E. coli is a normal, nice little part of our microbiome in our colon, but not strain O157H7. This causes hemolytic uremia syndrome and death. This is one you hear about in the news. It inherited a Shiga toxin, so a toxin from Shigella, through a bacterial phage infection. Salmonella enterica causes food poisoning instead of a toxin. Okay, it has a modification to its lipopolysaccharides, outer membrane, and evades our immune system. Streptococcus pyogenes causes scarlet fever and strep throat, but it got its pyrogenic exotoxin from a phage infection. Vibrio cholera causes the disease cholera, watery diarrhea. The toxin came from a phage infection. So just 
toxins, lots and lots of toxins were gained through transduction by a bacterial phage infection. The last one was conjugation. Conjugation has a C in it, so this is going to be that direct gene transfer through cell to cell contact. And so the donor cell has an F pilus, so they are F positive. It's, kind of, it's the closest thing to sex bacteria you're going to have, so X positive makes that pilus, and the recipient is F minus. Now, after we get transfer of DNA, plasmid, it can be some chromosomal DNA as well, not the whole thing, then this strain will become F positive and it can go on and pass those on to someone else. So much larger DNA can be transferred than transformation and transduction. So entire plasmids, even pieces of chromosomal DNA. So that's kind of another difference. But C, cell to cell contact through an F pilot. And here it is for you. I'm not going to ask you the different steps. So we've looked at these, this mobile gene pool. And so we talked about wild type. When bacteria can move things between other bacteria, they don't even have to be the same species, in the same generation, so the same space and time, all of those things that can be moved are called a mobile gene pool. So we talked about plasma DNA, phage DNA, we talked about those jumping genes, transposons. There's also something called genomic islands, which I'll let you read about in your textbook. But really simply, these are just large genetic segments in a cell genome that have originated from different species. This is where we get the different strains and the different serotypes of a type of a species of bacteria. And so it's estimated that less than 50% of E. coli genes found are found in all of the strains of Escherichia coli. And so those are termed the conserved genes or the core genome of the species. The rest of the combination of those different mobile genetic elements, that's where we get the different strains. And a lot of those times it's gonna bring about changes on the surface or antigenic changes. And so often we'll call that different serotypes or that's how they're gonna be diagnosed. So E. coli is E. coli, but E. coli 0157H7, that's gonna be a different serotype. Yes, us too. So we are 3.2 billion base pairs, 20,000 genes. <gasps> Look, only 1% of our DNA actually is coding sequences. We have about 3% of DNA transposons. We have some endogenous viruses, so proviruses that have integrated their DNA into our DNA. Retrotransposons, these are from retroviruses. We have a lot of that mobile gene pool as well. So that wraps this up. You have a great day.